So in this video, I just wanted to go over a few advanced uh, tips and tricks that I've learned while using Impact. I'm just going to jump around to a few pieces of code to give you an idea of, of some of the things that are making my, uh, my Resident Raver game run very well on, across different platforms. So the first thing that you want to really take advantage of is the fact that this can run very well on iPad and iOS in the web browser. So testing if your game is running under iOS, there is a utility class called UA inside of Impact. And this allows you to query for what type of device you're running on, whether you're running on mobile. Um, and in this case, we can test whether it's specifically running on iOS. As you can see here, I'm also able to use touch events. So I'm binding touch events based on the fact that I think that I see that it's on iOS. Uh, if not, it falls back to regular keyboard commands. Some other interesting things that I'm doing in my game is that I'm overriding the main game class's load level. So I'm able to process data from the level before it actually starts uh, in the game. So as you see here, I'm doing things like setting up instructions that are displayed at the bottom of the screen. I'm These are the core values uh, of, of the game when it starts. So there's instructions, whether I need to show stats at the top of the game, and then also what the default weapon is. And what this allows me to do is that I'm able to override these properties from the level itself. So I'll show you real quick in my level. I was talking about this in another video, but I have this settings property here. And on the settings property, I'm able to just add values. So I have default instructions here. I could also add what the default weapon is to start in this level. And this is really helpful for one, setting up your level uh, through the level editor itself but also for doing debugging. So there's many times that I want to test out a specific weapon. I'll set that as the default weapon for the level. As you see here, when the game loads up or when this level loads up, I go out, I get the settings property, and then I simply take any value that exists in that property and apply it to the game itself. So I can do some very interesting things like offset the camera from that settings. I can set the default weapon like I talked about the default instructions and whether or not to show stats. I'm also able to manually tweak the player based on these settings as well. So I can pass in stuff. I can make the player invisible if, um, or invincible if I want to show stats. And I can also tell the player to equip his weapon. So I highly suggest overriding the load level method of your game. This way you can actually take advantage of of bringing in properties and modifying properties of your game before they start up. Another important thing I do in the update method here is that I'm also set up a pause state. So if the game is paused, it's only running through entities that are allowed to be active. So an issue with traditional pause is that you don't want to just disable the draw or exit out of the update loop because if you're using entities for menus in your game, you are going to want to actually have them rendering. So each of my entities has a property called ignore pause. So when pause is set, I'm actually looping through each one. And if ignore pause is set to true, I'll update. So stuff like my menus and my text boxes, those things always ignore the pause, but everything else in the game will actually pause correctly. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm just being very careful about my draw, where I actually call draw. As you see, even in my code, I have big blocks of data that I'm going through and refactoring. So I'm always trying to keep, uh, I'm trying to take big chunks of code like this. This, this happens to be uh, st stats. And I wound up taking the stats and putting it into its own class in the menu class. So also, you know, try to break down your code as much as possible so you can find as much reuse reusability as possible. And the last thing I wanted to show you, at least in this class, is that I'm actually using other games to represent each of my screens. So I have a start screen. And as you see, I'm just taking advantage of nested classes here. So if I was to compress this, I have my main game class and I have my start class. Some other things that are really helpful is that if you're testing for mobile, you can disable sound. So one of the problems with Impact right now uh, is that sound support on Safari is, is not very good uh, when it comes to iOS. So you want to disable your sounds when you detect that it's in mobile. 
I can also test specifically for the iPhone 4 and I can up the resolution of the screen based on that uh, retina display. So here I'm doing a scale of four, whereas if it's the regular iPhone, I'm doing a scale of two. If it's the iPad, I'm doing a scale of three. Uh, and then the last, I just consider this to be any regular web browser. I set uh, the scale to three and I automatically go through and I remove the controls from the index.html so you don't see the touch controls. I also keep track of the version of my game so I'm able to test via tracking whether people have updated or not from the last version of the game. So I do a lot of stuff with stat tracking. So if we take a look at my tracking class here, as you see, I just created a regular, uh, a regular class that just extends off of the IG.class and I'm using Google Analytics. So I simply pass in what my account information is and I'm able to track events throughout the game. And this uh, module is, is, is available throughout the game, which is really helpful. So I keep very detailed analytics on whether people complete a level, how many levels they start, what the difficulty was, how many people they kill, so that I can use that information to see whether people like the game, whether they're actually making progress in the game, or if no one's even playing the game at all. Also, when it comes to JavaScript, some of the cool stuff that you can do based on prototyping is that you can actually prototype some of the core classes of JavaScript itself. So for strings, I do a little bit of text formatting. So I prototyped the string class in order to pad numbers or to capitalize first letters. So I just created a module for my string utilities. So it's, you know, there's a plugins folder in impact. It's important that you, you know, try to make as many reusable plugins as you can. I have a plugin for my camera class. I have a plugin for local storage and for uh, the strings, the string utility here and for tracking. Also, there is a, uh, this void class. This is an entity and all this entity does is you see, I've overridden update, but I don't actually call parent. So it never draws itself. It's just an empty up. Uh, it's just an empty entity that I can use to attach properties to. So if you go back to my level editor here, this you'll see is the void class and it, I just give it a name called settings. So this is very helpful. Um, it's part of when you get the impact source code, there's a directory full of um, other plugins for you to test out. So I definitely say check this out and I use this void all over the place. This void represents all these objects here. This door um, is a void and I'm able to connect each one of these voids up to my spawner so that the spawner gets a position of where it needs to spawn something. The elevator uses each one of these voids for which floor to land on or where its cable is connected to. So this is a really important class and, and something that I take advantage of a lot, especially in all of my maps. And the other thing I wanted to show is just a really complex entity. So if you look at the elevator, the elevator is actually broken up into three, com uh, three entities. The first is the background of the elevator itself. And then there are two platforms, one for the top and one for the bottom. And this is the way that the player is actually able to get into the elevator and stand on it and also stand on the top. And the way that I've done that is I've just set up, this is one entity here that represents my elevator, but I have a mover, which is a platform, and I have specific a specific platform that is how the elevator understands how to create the top and the bottom platform and how they all interact. So as the elevator moves, I'm also moving the top entity and the bottom entity to match the same velocity as the elevator itself. So another really important thing just to keep track of is that you want to actually cut down on the number of draws that you have in your game. So if I go into my impact game here and I turn on the debugger, so by simply including the impact.debug debug class, I can go into my game and when I run it, you'll see here on the bottom, I can actually test the performance of how the code is executing, if there are any problems or bottlenecks, and I can also test out how many draws there are. What I wanna show you is that as you see here, I now have 145 draws. Uh, the frame rate is running a little bit slow also because I'm doing the screen capture, but what you'll notice here is that from level to level, I spend a lot of time optimizing the draw calls. So right now, 
this went down to 32 draws. And the reason is that each piece of text, each character represents its own draw. Hopefully you just noticed that when that text went away, it jumped down to nine draws. So try to avoid using text and fonts as much as possible. Another thing that I can show you is that if I went into the level editor, that my map is set to pre-render in the game. And this really increases the performance. Without this set, every one of these tiles is gonna be drawing and you're gonna get a lot of draw calls. So make sure that you always pre-render your uh, tiles uh, in, in game. If you don't, if you do this and you have background animations, of course, unfortunately, the background animations are going to uh, be disabled. And one thing you can do is you can do this programmatically when you load the level up. So you can detect that if you're on iOS or on, if you're on mobile to pre-render everything and you lose the animations, but you get a speed increase. If you are on the desktop, you, you may not care so much about it and you can disable that so you can have a little bit of a richer experience. So all in all, these are kind of the tips and tricks that I've used in order to make my impact games run incredibly fast across all the devices that I, I deploy them to. And hopefully you found this interesting.